So friends, a very warm welcome to each of you to this very special by invitation only event. You have been invited to join us today because of your commitment to help Rotary achieve our goal of a polio free world. My name is Ravi, Ravindran. I serve as the chair of the trustees of the Rotary Foundation this year. And I have been a president of Rotary International previously. And I must tell you, I'm delighted to be here as your host. We have an exciting program ahead for the next hour or so. And uh, when we shall be in conversation with film producer, Jonathan Cavendish and his mother, Diana. Jonathan, you would have heard produce the movie Breathe about his legendary father, who was a polio survivor and a disability rights campaigner, Robin Cavendish. Rotary partnered with the film when it was released in 2017. I must tell you that I have a personal and an emotional interest in the film because my mother, just like Robin Cavendish, was completely paralyzed by polio when she was just 31 years old and I was 11 years with three siblings who were all younger to me. It was a group of Rotarians, actually club mates of my grandpa, who collectively used their individual connections to rush from London to Colombo in Sri Lanka, a respirator which saved her life. After two years, she was fortunate enough to be weaned out of the respirator, which my family then donated to the hospital. So I can identify with every bit of willpower displayed by Robin Cavendish, for I can picture my mother going through similar motions. They gave her to live, they, they gave her, I mean, a couple of days to live, but she went on to be 78, never normal, but with an indomitable will, a board at her bedside always read, every day, in every way, I am getting better and better, and I still preserve that board. Yes, friends, uh, 57 years ago, my mother's life was perhaps the very first to be saved from polio by Rotarians. We have saved millions of lives since then. But now, let's get on with the show. I'm your host tonight, but delighted I am, there is a far better person, a more professional person, a well-known TV presenter, Connie Huck, and she will be your moderator. Welcome, Connie, it's all yours. That's a very nice compliment there. I'm blushing, I think. I'm absolutely delighted to be here as a Rotary Purple for Polio ambassador. And I'm so glad to support Rotary's campaign to rid the world of polio. We are nearly there and we can do it. One reason that I care so deeply about this is because I went to India with Rotary and saw firsthand Rotary's polio campaign there. I was making films for Rotary and also a feature for BBC News. And I remember putting the polio drops into children's mouths to immunize them against this dreadful disease. I realized now that I was taking part in a moment of history because India was certified polio free in 2014. And this year we achieved the significant milestone of Africa being declared wild polio free. These are truly amazing achievements. If we could end polio in India, a country with a population of more than 1.3 billion, and in the whole of Africa with a population of 1.2 billion, we could definitely do this everywhere. Wow, Connie, you, you, I'm, I'm impressed with your homework, with, with the, your knowledge. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you to everyone for joining us for this very special event. You will all be muted for the main part of our conversation, but do stay on after the hour for everyone to be able to socialize virtually till 7.30 p.m. London time. It will be a little late for me, past midnight, but I intend to stay on myself. The the COVID-19 pandemic has truly shaken the landscape of the world 
and presented communities with a challenge for which there is arguable, arguably no existing playbook. The Rotary International and the Rotary Foundation boards decided that we will encourage clubs to participate in the COVID vaccine distribution. We have the ability, we have the experience gained from polio to do so, but we strictly agreed that we will not, we will not be involved in the sourcing and funding of vaccines. Our focus must be on polio and the focus on raising money for polio vaccines must never waver. While we are very close to our stated goal, remember, we have to continue with our routine vaccination as well. Last year, do you realize that there were 400 million children who were routinely immunized against polio in 40 countries? So let's not take the foot off the pedal at this most critical of moments. Please do make a donation. And because I'm asking you, and because I want to lead by example, I sent a check yesterday myself for $15,000 for polio. So my friends, I have no qualms in asking you. Ravi is absolutely right. You cannot take your foot off the pedal because polio can resurface quickly. It was eradicated in China and it resurfaced there before we got rid of it again. So please, please, please donate. And this is how you can make a donation. You can either scan the QR code that you can see on the screen right now, or you can go to the donate page by using the bit.ly link, which is shown on your screens. <laughs> we'll also put the bit.ly link in the chat box from time to time. So please, please dig deep. Now, Ravi, you mentioned how long Rotarians have been campaigning and working to end polio. Can you tell us where we're at now? Uh, Connie, we have never been so close as we are today to eradicating polio. When we started over 30 years ago, nearly 1,000 children a day were infected with the virus. Today, we are a long way better, even historic, I would say. In the last six months, only two boys in the world are newly suffering from the wild polio virus. There is not a single girl child anywhere in the last half year who has contracted wild polio. We have kept over 19 million persons walking and living who otherwise would not be had we not had our passion and perseverance for ending polio. Yet, as we close in on our goal, the challenges of the current day need to be overcome. We need to work in unison in ending polio and in stopping the current pandemic. This includes integrating all immunizations into a seamless improved delivery systems. It is renewing our commitment to equity to see that the polio vaccine, well, and for that matter, all vaccines are available to every community across the world. We need to advocate to community leaders, including anti-government elements in Afghanistan, to set aside differences for a few days, to allow them to safely immunize their children. We need to recognize, my friends, the contributions of our frontline workers, especially the women who provide most of the drops. You know, the polio program also needs to be funded to reach the end. The United Kingdom has been generous from the beginning in providing international assistance, but now needs encouragement to stand with us to the end. This is not a good time to reduce our funding by 95%, 95% as has been proposed by your government. You can help by providing encouragement to your members of parliament. With a month to go in the Rotary year, we also see giving by Rotarians falling by about 15% where we were a year ago. Thus, we are truly in danger of not reaching the full amount of our goal and in the process, 
foregoing part of the two to one match offered to us by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. To paraphrase your great British author, Charles Dickens, we can see ahead the best of times, but it will be the worst of times if we fall short just before the finish line. So my dear friends, eradicating polio was never going to be easy. We know that. We have overcome obstacle after obstacle. We have raised more money than anyone thought possible. We have immunized over 3 billion children, billion. We are now down to just two wild polio cases in the whole world. It is time, as my predecessor, past RI President D.K. Lee said, to make our dreams real. It is time to come together, all of us, to end polio now and forever. And I am counting on you. Thank you so much, Ravi, for setting the scene. We are on the cusp. Um, we know where we are in our fight to eradicate polio. We are nearly there. So come on, guys, dig deep. Now, that brings me on to introducing our guest speakers today, film producer Jonathan Cavendish and his mother, Diana. Mm -hmm. As mentioned earlier, Jonathan produced the movie Breathe, the true story about his legendary father, polio survivor Robin Cavendish, who contracted polio in Kenya in 1958 at the tender age of 28. Jonathan is also a Rotary Great Britain and Ireland Purple for Polio ambassador, as he knows how important it is to protect every child with the polio vaccine so we can totally eradicate polio. But before we talk to Jonathan and Diana, let's see a clip from Breathe, where Diana helps Robin escape from hospital. Ready? So long, chap. Best so long. of luck, Robin. So long, Paddy. I'll be back for my fiver. Mm -hmm. I miss you, pal. We're taking my husband home. You don't have my permission. There's a prison. My old prisoner. What do you think you're doing? It is the patient's own wish, sir. He's fully apprised of the risks. Take him back to the ward at once. Diana, call the police. Tell them I'm being held against my will. I, I'm sorry? What did you say? You have no right to, to keep me in this place. Of course. Be my guest. Let's go. Do as you please. You'll be dead in two weeks. A very powerful clip there from the film Breathe. And we are absolutely delighted that Jonathan and his mother Diana are with us. Jonathan. Great to have you with us. Um, now, some of the highly successful films you've been involved in include the Bridget Jones series of movies and Elizabeth, The Golden Age, which are also very different to Breeze. Why did you decide to make this dramatic and very moving film about your father? Well, if, you, uh, if you're a film producer, you're looking for stories. And <clears throat> I was born into a story and um, so I, it wasn't something that I, I couldn't go through my professional life without telling that story. Um, but the big problem was that 
I couldn't find the right actors to play my parents. So Bill Nicholson, the great English screenwriter, Oscar nominated screenwriter, and I worked on the script for about 10 years. But I thought we would never make the film because I couldn't find somebody who I felt would do justice to my father or my mother. And within one week, uh, I met Andrew um, and Claire Foy, Andrew Garfield and Claire Foy. And that was the moment I knew that we could make the film. Um, and that was, that was very exciting. And it was a strange experience to, to sort of see parts of your life unfold in front of you. It was, it was very moving in many ways and very exciting. Um, and I was you know, thrilled with the end result in the end. It must be a tad surreal. And I can imagine very tricky to cast uh, your own parents. Diana, before we talk about the film and Robin's life with polio, can you paint a bit of a picture for us about your life together before this devastating virus struck? Okay, well, um, we got married and we went 3000 miles away. It's a jolly good thing to do after you get married. And, you know, we were young and carefree and my husband was a tea broker. He's working for this firm. And so he used to go around to see all these um, tea estates in distant, beautiful places. And um, I used to go along too, because, you know, a lot of the wives there didn't see anybody different. So, you know, in a way I sort of um, cheered them up, I suppose. Um, and, you know, we had this young, carefree life. It's a beautiful country, Kenya. Um, you've been there, yes. I, I I have actually, yes, and it does, it sounds like quite an idyllic existence as a sort of young married couple, absolutely. Now, <laughs> in the clip that we just saw there, um, there was a warning from the doctor at the end um, that Robin would only last two weeks, but yeah. he went on to live, didn't he, for another 36 years? Um, well, he died when he was 64, so he got polio when he was 28. So he was right, in hospital right. for a year in, in Oxford, having been flown back from Kenya. And, so. and you know, w what you did in taking Robin out of hospital, I mean, that was a pretty brave and courageous thing for you to do, and sort of previously unheard of, almost sort of discharging against the doctor's wishes. Where did, where did your courage come from? And what were the most sort of challenging things during those times? Sorry, I, I really don't know. I mean, Robin was fed up with being in hospital. So yeah. um, I, I looked around for, got enough money to buy a house. Near, uh, the best thing we did actually was to stay 10 miles from Oxford. And, um, you know, that was that really. You just had to get things together and organise. And it wasn't easy. You didn't get much support from the state in those days financially. I mean, it's much better now, isn't it? And of course, um, uh, people regarded disabled people in a completely different light as to they do now. I don't think it was particularly courageous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess there was sort of more ignorance in those days. You're absolutely it's right. There's race, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> there does seem to be more sort of inclusivity now. How, you know, how long was it between sort of planning that we're going to take Robin out of hospital to sort of actually sort of sealing the deal? Well, I mean, after all, um, after he'd been there for a few months, it, it mm. was clear that he wasn't going to get any better. And um, he was on a tracheotomy, you know, the air was pumped yes. in. Him. And um, the doctors wanted to put him into an iron lung. And he sensibly realized that uh, he'd be much more restricted in an iron lung. So he said he wasn't going to. And um, so, you know, they said, oh, we don't know how long anybody on a tracheotomy is going to last. So, you know, you just don't know, do you? Anyway, you know, they, that's what he wanted to do. So he wouldn't have minded at that stage if he died in two or three weeks, frankly. But after about being at home and everything, <laughs> It all worked out, you know, as well as could be expected. Absolutely. And the fact that he was strong willed, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, will have exactly. been sort of paramount to exactly. yeah, his exactly. uh, condition. Quite, quite. Yes, he was a very strong character. And also, he was a very sociable person. Because I, I think that if you're disabled, it's much more helpful if you are social, outgoing not introverted and he was 
frightfully outgoing. He loved people. And, you know, anybody who wanted his advice was only too happy to give it to them. So that's what it was. Much better to be at home with the child. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of the child. Uh, Jonathan, you were born after your father contracted polio so your relationship was one where his condition was essentially the norm for you that's all you really knew um what are your most lasting memories of your dad in your early life well it came as a bit of a surprise to me when I went to school that uh other people's dads didn't you know weren't being wheeled around in a wheelchair that was the first surprising thing and um I think it was the normality of the way that my parents lived their life. You know, it was it was a strange mixture, our home, between a very, as my mother says, a very social environment with lots of friends coming in and out and lots of other disabled people coming to be given advice by my parents who seemed to be coping so well uh, with, this, with this terrible affliction. But, I mean, you know, literally in the morning, one of my favourite things to do was to go into my parents' bedroom after I'd had breakfast and kind of be there while he was prepared in the morning, including, you know, having his bedpan. And as a young child, I remember, you know, having competitions of, well, that bedpan was a lot smellier than yesterday's bedpan. <laughs> and there was no embarrassment. It was just, you know, there he was, completely brave enough to be unembarrassed by being, you know, naked and helpless in front of his young child which which is a pretty extraordinary thing to to do so it was the normality and the fun they had very good senses of humor my parents as did their friends and that was one of the things I tried to build into the film was to show that everything was fun um, and a lot of what my father did because his mom said in those days there was a huge amount of nervousness around disability because most severely disabled people when were in they were still stuck in hospital so nobody had come across somebody of that degree of disability and he subtly realized that he had to make people feel at ease because they were nervous of him his chair made a noise he breathed in a funny way he couldn't shake hands we had a terrier my beloved dog Benji who would sit on his lap and if somebody came along who he didn't like the look of and reached out a hand tentatively to greet my father, Benji would snap the finger off or make a decision at any rate. So this, a life that many people would think was rather odd, to me was entirely normal. It is all, it's just perceptions, isn't it? Because normal is in the eye of the beholder, essentially. Um, you know, did you find, Diana, that people, some people treated you differently after Robin's disability? Like, was there a sort of distinct sort of change in how people you knew, knew treated you? Uh, well, there was that awful thing about uh, does he take sugar, you know? Um, I remember we met somebody somewhere and the man said to me, oh, um, I think I was at school with your husband. I said, well, why don't you ask him? You know, you had to overcome that sort of thing. I think, I think people were nervous, actually. You know, because there was Robin puffing and panting and speaking in this odd way. By the way, I would just like to say about Andrew Garfield is that to uh, people who didn't know Robin would not have known how absolutely brilliant Andrew was, down to the twinkle in the eye. He was brilliant. He, he wasn't he, Johnson? Extraordinary. Well, so was Claire. Um whether you like it or not. She got you down to the <laughs> 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 oh, the, the time I realized that Claire was the right person to play my mother was I saw a very early trailer of um, The Crown at some awards show. And I read that my, there is something not unregal about my mother. And I just felt <laughs> that, that that was when I realized that she was the right person, Crown or not. And what about Andrew? Well, Andrew, um, my father was a, you know, he'd be served in the army. He was a, in some many ways, a traditional English man of his period, but po possibly because his life had depended on so many wonderful women, not just my mother, but the carers who looked after him and the people who 
who were there to, to provide him with the support and love that he, that he cherished. I think he became himself very feminine in his interior life. And Andrew has that, um, you know, that, that ability to see the female side, the emotional side of things, that emotional intelligence. And that was the thing that I recognized immediately in Andrew. Yeah. Empathy, always very good quality in, in men and women, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, we have- Rarer in men, I think. Opinion. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so Robin became a campaigner on disability rights and as a polio survivor, attended conferences to speak on the issues of people living with severe disabilities outside of hospitals. Doing this that, at that time back then was pretty unprecedented. I mean, how groundbreaking was this and how did it come about? Diana. Uh, well, um, we were asked to go to Germany um, with Dr. Jeffrey Spencer, who was the leading expert on respiratory polio. We were asked to go to Germany to um, talk to these people in Munich. Um, my niece came with us and she said she was very good at German. She wasn't good at German, but she was good at reading the map. Um, anyway, in Germany, as you can slightly imagine, everybody was kept in hospital in neat rows. <laughs> and so Robin was spoke to all these people and said, look, here I am. Um, I, I lead a normal life and, um, you know, I have people to look after me. My wife looks after me and she drives me about. And, um, you know, why can't you do the same for your people who've got polio who are, you know, lying in neat rows in hospitals? And actually, he got a standing ovation. So... Wow. Whether it did any good, I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> I like to think it did. <laughs> I mean, you know, people will have looked at him and thought, well, why can't we? You know, if you've got a disability, you'd look at Robin with jealousy, essentially. Yes, no, um, no, quite. But these were all sort of medical people, you see, who were at the conference. So hopefully they went back to their hospitals and did something about it. Um, absolutely. Yeah, the thing is, we never checked up really, but I expect it's very much anything to do with disability. And what people seem to forget, they they lump disabled people together, and every single person is different. Yeah, That's what people forget. Absolutely, it's sort of all specific to the individual. So, Jonathan, you shared your earlier memories with us, but what about when you became an adult, moving on with your life? What then? Well, I was very lucky, unlike <clears throat> many of my friends, I was very close to my parents. <clears throat> my parents were very, very close to my friends. And so um, my father and mother became this sort of repository of humor and wisdom and advice to a whole generation of people, um, many, of whom, many of whose parents were, were really seemingly not that interested in them, particularly their their dads. I mean, I think there's a thing in England whereby um, it's much different now, but if your father, in my parents' generation, probably their parents, their grandparents had, you know, probably fought in a war, maybe not returned or come back different. So there was a, a carapace of um, form, formality between uh, even in my generation's parents to my friends. And my parents were very not like that because my father had the time um, to sort of dig deep into my, um, my friends, you know, twisted romantic relationships and things like mm -hmm. that. He was, he was hugely good at giving advice, um, incredibly nosy um, and inquisitive yeah. and had a very good memory. So people would be shocked at the amount of information that he had stored away <clears throat> about them. Um, because his very large brain and energy, a lot of it was put into people. And as mum says, you know, if you are severely disabled, it, and it, help, it greatly helps to be interested in people. Um, and, you know, he was lucky enough to be charismatic and, and funny. Um, so I love nothing better than going home. I love no, nothing better than taking my friends home. Um, and most of my, you know, memories of my father are sort of laughing, having a lovely time. We used to go down to 
um, a house in Devon that was owned by the man who invented my father's wheelchair, an extraordinary man called Professor Teddy Hall. Um, and right at the very end of the film, those who've seen it will remember a scene of my father being pulled across a beach in a wheelchair with a rope. Um, and, the, and we still, my mother and my children and my wife and I still go to that beach every year now. Um, oh. So it was, a, it was an adventurous life. You know, they went abroad. Sometimes I went with them. Um, as depicted in the film, sometimes you arrived at a hotel and you couldn't fit into the hotel bedroom, so you had to take the door off the hinges. Um, sometimes, um, you know, there were all sorts of adventures. The, the, the rather spectacularly photographed event in Spain, where we ended up overnighting, I think it was near a roundabout rather than on a very beautiful hillside, um, and there was, you know, we were um, serenaded by the, uh, the local Spanish population and provided with food and the local priest came to bless my father. All that stuff in the movie actually did happen. Um, and I think, you know, and my uncle did blow the wheelchair up by putting the plug in <laughs> the wrong, into the wrong bit. And, and, you know, if you'd been too worried about... I mean, my parents were, and my mother will hate me saying this, incredibly effortlessly brave. Like that was a pretty remarkable thing to do. Teddy had to, had to build another breathing machine and bring it out on a plane and get in a taxi and turn up and put it into the back of his chair, you know? And he was giving a lesson, um, a tutorial at Oxford at the time. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's an extraordinary to think about really now. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable. It's it's like sort of the things that happen at the time. You almost don't realise till afterwards how extraordinary, you know, things like that are. It's, it really is, you know, what would you consider to be the most impactful thing that Robin achieved during his lifetime, do you think? It's a tricky one. Mom? Either Diana and Jonathan. Well, both um, he, he thought that, um, you know, he, he realized that it was important for me to be able to get away for about a couple of weeks every year. And then he had to go into intensive care. There was no other way of doing it. And so he realized that what was needed was a place that people like him could go and have a nice time and be looked after properly. And um, so he and Dr. Jeffrey Spencer got together um, and um, they had to raise all the money for this place called Netley Waterside House. Um, and it took quite a long time. In the 70s, it was easier raising money then. So, um, so that was, um, the Lambeth Borough Council joined in with us. And um, so eventually this place started and it was a great success. Uh, but of course it had to have particularly uh, special nursing for people like Robin, you know, on respirators and that sort of thing. I think that's probably one of the things that, what do you think, Jonathan? No, I think that's right, because that also started a whole understanding that severely disabled people could go on holiday and, you know, nobody needs a change of scene more uh, than severely disabled people, but people don't seem to think of it like that. So it broadened out alongside their pioneering work and their pioneering work really was showing the life that they were living to everyone else and they became and my mother will hate me saying this quite famous in a way so for example when my father died a friend of mine was working for a huge london law firm a rather stuffy place i suspect where they had 1500 people and the head the um, senior partner summoned everybody to a special meeting and they thought they were all going to be sacked and he said, I want to read you the most extraordinary obituary I have ever, ever read in my life. Uh, and, and read my father's obituary to 1,500 rather surprised lawyers. And <laughs> said, you know, this should make us all different and better people. Go away and be a different and better person, he said. <laughs> so I think there were, there, you know, the life, the life lived, um, which affected a great many people. I think that was another extraordinary thing. And now the film, which has brought that, that life to literally now millions of people all, all over the world. Um, one of my favorite stories about the film is I was traveling on an airplane. Uh, fortunately, 
paid for by an American studio. So I was at the front of the play or near the front of the play. <clears throat> and I could see that about eight or nine different people were watching Bree in, in the, you know, on the in-flight entertainment. And I said to the, uh, rather disingenuously, I said to the <laughs> air steward, what's that film? And he said, oh, that's a film called Bree. He said, and we put on extra supplies of brandy when that film's on because everybody <laughs> gets so emotional. <laughs> so I thought it was pretty good. And little did they know who you were. <laughs> no, I didn't tell them, no. <laughs> Not even when the plane landed. Definitely. They were oblivious now. Oh. <laughs> Your father touched, you know, touched so many lives, as you said, in so many different ways. Um, you know, not least through the film, even though he's not with us now. Um, tell us a bit about the charity Refresh and um, the work of the charity. Well, um, sorry, you start, you say. Yeah, so, so Refresh, um, we, we've morphed charities. So we, we created a charity uh, after my father died called CS Disabled Holidays. Um, and the charity sold Netley Waterside House, half of that money and a great deal of money that was left in my father's memory by various friends and, and well-wishers. So we, we created a charity that we run today that's called CS Disabled Holidays and that funds um, up to 50% of the holidays for severely disabled people. Um, and it's a huge success. Um, we provide... Um, about 100 people a year now with the ability to go on holiday. They choose where they go. We help them if they need some advice, but it's very much they decide where they want to go. Um, and we're growing it, you know, year on year. Demand massively bigger than what we can provide. So we try to raise money all the time. But also we have a new initiative, which is very exciting, which some of your members may be able to help, which is... Um, my wife and I, we live in Wiltshire and we have um, just converted a stable block <clears throat> with beautiful views um, to provide accommodation for um, a severely disabled family or individual to go and stay, um, you know, comfortably and with all uh, the right provisions. Um, and many people who let out their houses, I know, will have spaces that would be perhaps not um, convenient for really disabled people, but we're opening it up now to um, less disabled people using this expanded opportunity because of, you know, people renting their houses. And we've had lots of people come forward and say, we'd give you two weeks a year at our house, for example, that we rent out or a wing of our house or whatever. So if there's anyone listening who, who would like to do that, or who knows of anybody who would like to do that, please go to the CS Disabled Holidays website and communicate back with us, and then we can put you on the website as a, somebody who wants to provide a much, much, much needed break for somebody who is severely disabled. Wow, what a fantastic and much needed initiative. Um, yes, please, Rotarians, get involved. That's, that's a really good sort of niche. Um, that you've struck upon there that really does need addressing. So uh, I wonder, Jonathan, if we could talk a little bit more about your life as a movie and television producer. Um, and if you tell us a little bit more about some of the other films that you've made. Um, well, um, the film that's, at the moment, uh, we're doing quite a wide variety. So Andy Circus is my business partner. He directed Breathe very brilliantly. And yeah. some of you may have seen him playing Gollum and Lord of the Rings and Caesar and Planet of the Apes and Star Wars and all of those great movies. And we've just completed a film, which may not be to all of your taste, called Venom, Let There Be Carnage with Tom Hardy, uh, which is coming out very soon. And we've also just made a movie with a brilliant director called Taika Waititi, uh, with Michael Fassbender starring. He was the, uh, Taika had made a film called Jojo Rabbit, which some of you may have seen. Oh yeah. Uh, which is a brilliant true story of the American Samoan football team and the aftermath of them losing 32 nil in a World Cup qualifier. But it's a film for, it's, it's the world's first ever Polynesian football comedy. Let's put it like that. Um, 
But I, I've had this really weird period recently because it was the 20th anniversary of the first Bridget Jones film. Um, and so there's been a huge amount of uh, interest in, in that. And I've been giving sort of lots of interviews to people. And one of the stories that surfaced, um, which is totally true, is that when Rene Zellweger, who is not a nice um, plump English girl, but a stick thin Texan, was cast by the director and myself to play this very sort of English iconic figure, we were very nervous about everybody's response. So I made Renee come to England six months before we started filming. And I talked to a friend of mine who had a publishing company and I made him employ her as a publishing um, uh, assistant in the publicity department called Bridget Cavendish. And she worked in that department for four months. Every day she would go in and the only sign that she was who she was. She was pretty famous at this point. Um, her boyfriend was a man called Jim Carrey, who was a not unknown American movie star. And she had a photograph of him in her little cupboard and people couldn't quite work out why that was. And then one day she rang up and she said, there's an elderly bachelor um, publisher who's asked me out and I can understand why he is a bachelor. What do I do? And I said, you've got to go out with him. <laughs> She rang me that night and she said, if you make me do that again, I'm going back to America. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she, at the end of that period, uh, that what I hadn't realized, because she was too uh, humble to tell me, is that um, her boss, not knowing that she was Renee Zellweger, offered her a full-time job, which was <laughs> pretty cool, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> How did you end up casting a stick thing Texan for the part of a plump? British publisher. It does beg the question, how know, did that come about? <laughs> I know, it's a funny one. Sharon Maguire, the director, who had uh, been given the job because she was Shazza in the original books. She hadn't actually ever directed a drama before. Um, she and I just fell in love with Renee. Renee said, wrote to me and said, I am Bridget. And I went, I doubt that. And she said, and I'm coming to England. And we had dinner with her and I went, actually you are Bridget. So. Fine. It took a lot of persuading of the American studios who had other more English people in mind. I won't tell you who they were, um, mm -hmm. but um, no, it was a bit of a gamble, but she was brilliant and is brilliant. Yes, absolutely. As a wonderful person and actually an amazingly humane person. She does an incredible amount of work for charity without anybody knowing. Wow, that's great. Do, do, do you think your dad's and sort of how he was and how your mum and your dad brought you up and sort of your story sort of helped with your becoming a storyteller, essentially. No, I think, and this is a, this is a terrible story to tell mm. myself, but if mm. I do, my mother will. Um, <laughs> I, I was an only child and very happy only child but quite solitary because in the morning you know my parents were busy and you know they had a lot of other things going on and so I started inventing uh, worlds of my own and became in fact something a fantasist um, <laughs> to the point whereby it was slightly problematic at some points um, and I think I realized that if I didn't have an outlet for storytelling that uh, it, you know it could all end badly um, so that's, I think, why I did it, because it certainly wasn't in my, fa in my family's tradition to go into the arts at all, actually. Uh -huh. um, so I, I think it was um, a, a kind of move to save myself from early prison. <laughs> well, you did it. <laughs> no <laughs> prison here. Um, so finally, a question for both of you. How important is it, it's a pretty obvious question, but we want to hear it through your mouth, that we rid the world of polio? And what would Robin's view have been about all of this? Well, of course, you thought it was incredibly important. I mean, you know, <clears throat> I mean, we were so careless. <clears throat> I think we probably could have had the sugar lump, but I have a feeling that... Um, we probably had an appointment and then, you know, something else turned up. Um, and I, I suppose that um, Robin's life is a prime example that you just must 
uh, everybody must get vaccinated or whatever it is you do now, have a sugar lump. Um, I remember when we were staying with this wonderful person in uh, Belgium and we went on a boat and all the children were staring at Robin and she was a wonderful person. She said, you look what will happen if you don't have your sugar lump. <laughs> <laughs> In front of Robin, did she say that? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Do you remember Susie? The mm. pen. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Robin would have thought if it's if it helps one more person. No, I don't then... think he minded at all. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. From what I'm getting from Robin, I can I can see that. Jonathan. Um, no, I think he, you know, he he would have been extremely anxious to make sure that a polio was eradicated and that having seen so many other polio victims and and all the other horrible diseases that 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 restrict people to wheelchairs and things like that he he carried a lot of that you know he'd seen so much of it so he would be an absolute if he was here today he would be a staunch staunch supporter of everything that rotary has done and continues to do and yes the gap must be closed, the money must be raised, the disease must be eradicated, and he would absolutely be behind that in every every step of the way. Absolutely, we must seal the deal. Well, one thing is clear, he would be incredibly proud of you both. Um, thank you so, so much for sharing your stories. It's been really, really interesting and enlightening. Jonathan and Diana Cavendish, and thank you for sharing the crucial message about the importance of eradicating polio. We can do it, we are on the cusp. Now then, I want to ask Ravi to tell us a little bit more about Rotary's work for a polio-free world and how peace is an integral part of that. Ravi, you were involved, very involved, in fact, in the negotiations so that polio immunizations could be carried out in Sri Lanka, weren't you? Well, well, what did you do to make that happen? Sorry, before I answer that, I must say, I'm just thoroughly fascinated by the strength of character of this Robin Cavendish. And, uh, and, uh, I just realized listening to them that he was in the tea business that brings me closer to him now. But going back to your question, uh, I really can't take the credit for this, but let me tell you, 25 years ago, polio was still prevalent in my, in my country. Uh, at that time, a task force <clears throat> consisting of members of the government, UNICEF and Rotary was set up under Rotary leadership and the government accepted our proposal to run national immunization days. It was a time when there was a civil war going on in my country, which was really putting our country back so much. The government, which extended utmost support to us in every other sense, however, was planning to do this national immunization day only in the areas outside the uh, theater of war, which meant that one third of the country's children would not be vaccinated. Now, this was not acceptable to us. The government understood our reasons, of course, but they were powerless to help as their mandate simply did not run in certain parts of the country, which, which was at war. So we stepped in and in consultation with UNICEF, we volunteered to engineer a ceasefire if the government would extend the immunization to children throughout the country. The incredulous government, I mean, they never believed us, agreed. For us, it was a task easier said than done. We would have needed to establish contact with the then most feared and therefore most elusive terrorist leader in the world. Now, I'm not at liberty even today to elaborate too much on how we, we did this, but suffice for me to say, we did establish contact with the rebels. UNICEF also did their part and we endorsed each other's efforts. And to cut a long story short, a few weeks later, a letter was delivered at my office. The letter was signed by the feared rebel leader himself and had his insignia, a snarling tiger on the top, 
Remember, they were called the Liberation Tigers. It was brought to my table by my most fearful secretary, who with shaking hands uh, mumbled something about a letter. I grabbed the letter and the letter said amongst other things, Dear Mr. Ravindran, if you can persuade your government to stop the war for two days, then we are also willing to lay down our guns for two days, for our war is not with children. Well, we had our ceasefire. And consequently, we were able to carry out immunization through the whole country. We called it days of tranquility. Our vehicles bearing the rotary flag received the same respect, the same courtesy as a Red Cross would when, they, when, when their vehicles went, went with the Red Cross flag. And we traversed the vaccination booths in the so-called occupied areas. The terrorists trusted Rotary, they did not trust the government. That is an incredible story, absolutely wonderful. Yes. Oh, it's put tears in my eyes. <laughs> in what other ways uh, is our investment in polio, would you say, helpful to the world at large? <clears throat> well, you see, the polio infrastructure, Rotary helped build, including its tools, its workforce, its extensive surveillance networks, are all being used to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 right now by supporting preparedness and response activities in many countries, including Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. This truly represents, you know, the plus in Polio Plus. So building on decades of experience, stopping polio outbreaks, Rotary and our partners have a critical role to play in protecting communities from this unprecedented pandemic, just as the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, or GPEI, did in the past to respond to outbreaks of Ebola, to outbreaks of yellow fever, to outbreaks of avian flu. I wonder how many Rotarians know the impact we had on the Ebola crisis. One of the most terrifying scenarios to be modeled was one in which the virus would reach Nigeria. Because Nigeria is a trade hub for all of Africa with a dense population, poor sanitation, and a very high mobility. I remember or recall one public health official in Africa saying, the one thing nobody wants to hear are the words Ebola and Lagos in the same sentence. Well, Ebola did reach Lagos, Lagos the capital of Nigeria, on a flight from Liberia. But it spread no further because of the resources that were already in place there in Nigeria to fight polio. The emergency operation centers, the disease surveillance officers, the lines of communications between local and international health authorities, the capacity for real-time data analysis and modeling. Now, all of this was ready and waiting when it was most needed. And because of this infrastructure, established, funded, enlarged, in a large part by us, Ebola was stopped right there on its tracks. Without question, friends, good health, free of viruses, is conducive to peace. Or said the other way, a virus cannot be defeated if there's a lack of peace. Right now, the coronavirus has pushed the strife and conflict situations in the world to the background. You may have heard UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres appeal for a global ceasefire to help combat the coronavirus. It has largely gone unheeded, I mean, no one seems to care. Its implications are especially serious for those caught in the, middle of, in the midst of conflict. If, as seems likely, the dis disease disrupts humanitarian aid flows, it limits peace operations and postpones or distracts conflict parties from ongoing efforts at diplomacy. The other aspect, is that controlling the polio virus is good for business. I mean, let's leave all the health part aside. It's good for business. Once polio has been eradicated, 
the world will reap substantial financial as well as humanitarian dividends due to foregone polio treatment and re rehabilitation costs, depending on national decisions, of course, on the future use of polio vaccines. These savings could exceed $1 billion per year, each year, every year. In fact, recent modeling attests that eradication of polio will generate $14 billion in expected cumulative cost savings by 2050, when, when compared with the cost countries will incur for controlling the virus indefinitely. So in financial terms, the global effort to eradicate polio has already saved more than $27 billion in health costs since 1988. Wow. Now, at the opening of the World Health Assembly last week, Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, talked about COVID and said the pandemic will not be over until and unless transmission is controlled in every last country. This also applies to polio. The job is simply not done because polio anywhere is a threat to everyone everywhere as we already mentioned before. Ravi, how important is the polio programme in the COVID response? And how do we ensure we reach every last child with the life-saving polio vaccine? Uh, sorry, uh, let me go back a year. In February, February 2020, before all this uh, coronavirus pandemic really took off, mm. then president-elect, to President-elect Holger Knaf, who is not president, the polio chair, Mike Magavan, who does such a great job, our national polio plus chair from Pakistan, Aziz Mehman, who also does a fantastic job in Pakistan. Together, uh, we met together for high-level meetings uh, uh, in, in, in um, Lahore, in Karachi, in uh, Islamabad, to emphasize the need for additional government and army support. So we met their top leaders, we met the army chiefs, etc. Whilst being extremely cooperative, we were given a tour of the center of the country's health infrastructure. What I saw amazed me. We saw giant freezers which maintained the cold temperatures of many different vaccines. And we visited a call center where dozens of young people answered calls mm -hmm. around the country regarding the polio vaccine. I mean, we looked at computer screens, big screens, which showed every polio case and potential case in real time. It was quite fascinating technology. One month later, the personnel we met pivoted to spending much more of their time on the coronavirus. The call center was expanded tenfold to handle not only polio calls, but also coronavirus calls. The freezers were made ready for receiving the coronavirus vaccines, and the computers also now track the spread of COVID-19. Thanks to the polio infrastructure, Pakistan was quickly addressing every issue that needed to be considered in fighting COVID. In Africa, this was Pakistan in Africa, where much of the public health infrastructure is funded by the polio program, their polio laboratories, their freezers, their call centers, and their computer technicians similarly pivoted to respond to the pandemic. Dr. Mashidiso Moiti, I think, uh, the regional director of WHO of Africa region said, in Africa, no one has a footprint of the polio program, nor the expertise for mounting effective response campaigns. No one like the, the, like the polio program exists in that place. With COVID-19 threatening to overwhelm health systems, the extensive polio response network set up by Rotary is once again lending critical support as countries build up systems to contain the COVID-19. In the last nine months of 2020, nearly 4,000 polio partnership staff and contractors in 58 officers helped countries to respond. And the value of the polio program support during that period, you won't guess, 
$61 million. My friends, the Polio Independent Monitoring Board referred to the donation of support to the COVID pandemic as exemplary. They quoted the words exemplary. The Polio Oversight Board stated that it was a moral imperative to assist, and I agree fully. We are continuing to assist while not losing our focus on polio eradication. That is our corporate program. Parents in the polio endemic and the vaccine derived outgrowth countries are now more willing than ever to have their children vaccinated. Our staff is reinvigorated to end polio and we appear to be closer than ever to doing so. Between the work of the polio program and all of the global grants and individual club efforts, Rotary is making a mark in contributing to the response to COVID-19. Indeed. Thank you so much for that, Ravi. I've often heard Rotarians and others say that polio is only a plane right away. The whole world certainly now understands that because of COVID. And it's inspiring to hear how Rotary's campaign to eradicate polio is helping fight the coronavirus pandemic. And that shows just how important our continued support of Rotary's, Rotary's End Polio Now campaign is. I'd now like to invite past Rotary International President John Germ, who is Chairman of Rotary International End Polio Now Countdown to History Campaign Committee and Chair-elect of the Trustees of the Rotary Foundation, to say a few words of thanks. Over to you, John. Well, thank you very much, Connie. And let me start by thanking you for uh, being the moderator of this group. You've done an excellent uh, job asking the questions. Ravi certainly has done a fantastic job as the host and made these very eloquent comments uh, concerning Rotary's role. And Rotary started this program back in 1979 in the Philippines and has continued and let me promise you that Rotary will continue until we win this uh, war with the polio uh, virus. Jonathan, I'd like to thank you and your mother for being with us today. You've inspired us. You've told us the story of your father, Robin, and how important it was to him and to you and your mother that we do, in fact, eradicate polio and that we not only eradicate polio, but we work with the disabled individuals so that they know they can have a fulfilled life, just as many of us uh, know that uh, we can. It's always inspiring to hear the stories of people because my father had polio, so I can relate to what you're talking about with the devastation and the fear that goes uh, with that. And hopefully that fear is now being vanished and that we are making uh, great uh, progress. Our attendees, you're the one of the most important individuals that are here today because it's you that we are depending on in order to help us close our gap on our campaign this year. As of the end of April, on our $50 million campaign, we, as Ravi has previously said, we're about $16 million short, but May and June are very important months to us, and we're still, the books are still open on uh, in May and June, so obviously we're still getting money in every day uh, now, so we do thank our uh, attendees and ask you to go back and talk to your friends, uh, talk to your governors, talk to your governors elect and your neighbors. People don't re realize how important the eradication of polio is. But as Connie said, you know, it is a plane right away and it can impact lives all around the world. I would just want to close though with saying that, you know, it's not the money. Money is important, but it's not the money. It's what that money can do. That money can eradicate polio and make the world polio free. So let me thank everyone for being with us today. We hope that you've gotten as much out of this as I have. And we hope that you tell the story, to tell the story of how you can affect one individual's life by just one little contribution. So thank you very much for allowing me to be with you today. Thank, thank you, John. Um, John, uh, John, 
Durham is the chair next year, and I'm, I'm one of his great fans, and he's going to do a fantastic job. Maybe see the end of this poll year as well. Well, friends, everyone, please stay on if you can. Uh, this, this event goes on a little, little while longer. Uh, I don't know, it's 7.30 London time. I don't know what your time is. Mine is past 11.30 yet. You can all unmute yourselves, turn on your cameras, and mingle and chat to enjoy the rest of this special event. Uh, and uh, I will, uh, whilst I leave you in the safe hands of Eve Conway and Janine Birdwistle, I must also tell you, they were the two pillars on which this whole program was uh, built, assisted by Peggy from Evanston, uh, as, and, and we all got together virtually. Thank you very much. It's been great being with you. Have a great day. Ravi, Ravi, before yeah. you go, yeah. can I ask you one question, please? This is Leonard Munisinger from Rotary Club of Gold is Green. I, when you were a RI president, I wrote to you when I was president, but uh, I, I didn't get a reply. However, um, I'm asking you, as I'm a Sri Lankan, you are a Sri Lankan, and I really, really um, appreciate you, the way you have conducted yourself, you've gone up to the ladder, up the ladder and become the RI president. Uh, my question is, after you leave um, your, uh, your, your chairmanship, what would you do after that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll, I'll have a good long rest and a sleep, I think. Yeah. And, okay. Uh, Number two, second question is, would you be kind enough to speak to us, our, our Rotary Club? Gold is green. Oh, yeah, sure. Anytime. Thank you very much. So can I give you a date, please? Not now, but send me a mail. So can I have... Not, not now, Len. Thank you. We'll, we'll be in touch with you separately. Thank you. Yeah, Thank if, you. If you pass it on to us, we can pass it on to Ravi. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. I've got to leave now, but thanks very much for having me on your show, and I hope it's done you some good <laughs> okay thank you very nice much, to meet Diana. you Barbie. okay nice to meet you all thank bye you. bye bye, -bye. Thank you, Diana. that was one bye. Bye. Thank you very much bye you are almost all very welcome to stay with us uh through till 7 30. uh john Jern, uh, jonathan cavendish uh and mike um Mike Webb and others. We're all we're all here. Let's just chat and and mingle together virtually. It's an opportunity to to see each other when we're not going to be able to see each other anywhere else for a little while yet, probably. Yeah, and I, I think maybe if anyone's got a quick question to Connie, because I know Connie's got to go in a minute. Um, so uh, anyone want to ask Connie anything before she she leaves us? I don't. Eve, I don't know how many people know that Connie uh, actually went to India to do some filming uh, there, and we're appreciative of Connie of uh, that work that you did there because I think seeing the children and the crawlers makes a big difference uh, to people. Oh, absolutely. I'll never forget the shanty town, the rubbish tip, where a whole little town had grown up in this rubbish tip with the, everyone sorting through, finding anything valuable. And, you know, the conditions just perfect to spread polio. You know, I can still close my eyes and see it and smell it and feel it. But, you know, nearly there, nearly there. It will happen and it will happen soon and it will be momentous. You know, it will be amazing. Move over smallpox, polio is over. So thank you very <laughs> much, everyone. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. keep up the good work, one and all. Yeah. We can do it. Uh, thank you, Connie. Connie, thank Connie you. you're, a, you're, you're a class act. Thank you very much. Oh, no. It's all thanks to my my uh, my co-host, or rather the host. Uh, thank you so much, Ravi. It's fantastic to work with you. And hopefully catch you all again very, very soon. Good night. Take yeah. care all. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you. so much. Bye. Mukesh, your yeah. hand is up. You have a question you want to ask? Yeah, I was going to ask Connie, um, when is she going to become, uh, replace Naga on the breakfast TV show? Because Naga's disappeared. <laughs> but um, 
I think she's disappeared before I could ask that question, but uh, she, I'm sure probably, Eve can ask that question of her. Yeah, I, I so. can ask her. I think she may have some other things. She's writing lots of books and doing lots of things at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I've, 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 I've known about the, the books and everything, but it's just the fact that we're missing Naga on BBC Breakfast TV, and why don't they just bring um, Connie back instead of Blue Peter? He could be doing <laughs> Breakfast TV for us, and that would be yeah. even better. We're, we're very lucky that Connie has given us her time this evening because she's actually on holiday and she's really struggled to find anywhere with internet access so that well, she could be with I've us. Been, I've been on holiday for 15 months, locked in my house, <laughs> uh, because I'm in the shelter, I'm in the kind of shielding and extremely vulnerable group. So I, when Boris tells me to do this, but then don't do that, but do this, I know what that means, stay indoors. So I'm not going to do anything else until that finishes. And I live in Hounslow. You know, that's another problem. We're famous. We've never been so famous in Hounslow, uh, and except for the past week, because we're one of those surge locations, which yeah. prevented me from meeting Ross Kemp. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. I was going to Thanks. meet Ross Kemp, Thanks, but I could Yeah. I think we've got, obviously, Ravi here and John here. And, and Jonathan, I believe, is still with us. So... If he is, and got Barry questions. Rassin's with us as well. Oh, Barry, lovely to see you, Barry. How, how are things with you? Oh, things are, you know, Rotary in my country is running the vaccination program, so we're extremely busy <laughs> trying to reach all the population. And is, what's the virus like in the Bahamas? Is it... Um... Uh, well, we're a small country, so percentage-wise, we're not bad. We're about 152 in the world. Um, we locked down island by island. Um, so right now we got four islands locked down. Um, so it, it makes it a little easier for us. As long as we don't have an outbreak in the main island, then we, we're going to get the fancy island. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a worry everywhere, isn't it, really? But, I mean, if, if people have got questions, obviously we've got some amazing people still with us um, who can answer anything you want to know about polio or, or our polio campaign and how it's helping fight COVID. Yes, uh, Eve, I have a question. Do you think you could have made the 16 million shot from, from the screen? Well, it would be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> we can do our best. Can you all spread the message, please? You know, because it's so important. And, and, and it's, good, it's good to see trustee Frederick Lin in Taiwan. It must be past two o'clock in the morning there. Two yeah. o'clock here. It's two o'clock here. Ravi. I thought yeah, so. How are things in Taiwan? Ravi, we did get a nice uh, gift yesterday from the uh, District 7600. They transferred 100,000 more dollars than what they had already previously done from their DDF. So if we could get these uh, people to talk to the district governors and turn loose some of that DDF money that uh, they're not going to be able to spend this year, that could help shut that gap down pretty quick. Yeah, I think that's crucial, isn't it? District designated funds should not just be left in the idly in the bank, not doing anything, really. <laughs> I just let you know that District 1145, we donated 50K. Uh, so um, we're not as big as uh, John Germa said, but us down here in the south of England, uh, we've, we've managed to give you 50K, mate. Thank you. Thank hey, you so mate, thank you very much. Every dollar counts and every child appreciates it. Exactly. It's great to see Grace O'Malley here with us as well. Can I ask Grace, you a question, Eve? Grace is our rotor actor who, uh, who does a lot with her singing and many of our events. So it's nice you were actually just in the audience with us this evening, Grace. Yeah. Oh, it's been great. I've loved it. Thank you so much for the invite. Yeah, Grace <laughs> was a Rotary Young Citizen Award winner as well in 2013, weren't you? So, uh, and you're very Can active. Can I ask you a question on, on polio? I think she, she sang in our last event, didn't she? She did, yeah, she did. Definitely, yes. Um, so, and doing um, the new Road Track Club of London, Grace is a founder member, and she's also that club has raised a lot of money with virtual con a virtual concert last year for polio as well. So amazing. I can hear somebody, is it Varsi wants to ask a question? Yes, can I? It's it's about polio. Is that is that all right? Absolutely. Anyone can ask. <laughs> my my question is um. Am I un unmuted? Yes, I am. 
Yeah, yeah, you know. We can hear you. Um, after eradication, after, after, sorry? We can, can hear, hear you, me now. Bussie. We can hear you, Bussie. Can you, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, keep going. I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, my, my question is, um, after eradication, when will polio vaccine stop being routinely administered? Oh, oh. John, you want to answer that? It takes three years after the last case has been identified and I think we'll still be doing vaccinations for five or six years after that. So I'd say you're looking at a total of about a nine or 10 year program from today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Keith, you wanted to um, say something there? Yeah, I was going to say that's the cessation of oral polio vaccine, but with the there will then be a switch to inactivated vaccine, which will continue for quite a long time. And we're still using an activated vaccine here in the United States throughout Europe. So uh, it's the switch from oral polio vaccine, which it used to be said it's four years after the last case minimum. Yeah. I Thanks, Keith. Well, let, let's hope we get to that point sooner rather than later. Uh, Mukesh has got his hand up again, but is there anybody else that'd like to say something? Oh. Ask a question. Ask anything <laughs> that you like. David, you, you've got your hand up. Oh, they've all got their uh, hands up now. Uh, hi, Janine. Uh, yeah, just, just to tell you that we're driving Rotarians to drink. Yes. Um, by, selling, <laughs> by selling the Rotary gin. And uh, by the end of this uh, Rotary year, we will have raised... Uh, the, the, the sale of the gym will have raised over twenty thousand dollars. So uh, you know, every bottle we sell raises six pounds twenty, and uh, we're just driving everyone to drink. It's great. We're, Denise and I both got one purple gin. We've got it here. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Twelve eighty five. Yeah, it's totally alcoholic. Um, <laughs> Molly, we'll come we're to you already. next. But Jonathan, can I just ask you? Um, are you happy to tell us something um, briefly about the project that you're working on with Andy at the moment? Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, we're just finishing a film uh, called Venom um, <laughs> with Tom Hardy, which is... Mm. A, a yeah, I was thinking about something that you're doing in the UK that we had a... Um, if, if that's not appropriate yet, yeah, that's fine. No, absolutely. And uh, what was that? Um, yeah, we're about to start shooting a, a series for Netflix called Half Bad. No, no, no. We're, we're not talking movie here. I'm obviously talking cryptically here. This is yes. uh, a program. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, sorry. Yes, so, yes, so Andy and I um, started an initiative with Coventry University, uh, which is called the Gallery of Living History, um, which is a way of using academic historians to tell new stories of the untold and recontextualize bits of British history um, so that everybody in the UK, young people and diverse people particularly, feel that they own their own history. Um, so we're combining technology and storytelling with history because we feel that at the moment, young people don't feel that they're being told the whole story of the of British history. Um, you know what the colonial history and empire history really means, and many many diverse people we've interviewed don't actually know why they're here. They don't know the story of British Empire that means what you know the reason that they've ended up here, and as a result, they feel slightly detached from the mainstream of the UK. And we, we think that's very dangerous. And we also think that a lot of young people have sort of tuned out of history. So in Coventry over the next few years, there will be this extraordinary new form of a very rigorously researched, um, technologically told history, films, music, documentaries, virtual reality, um, and a way of just bringing us all together, a way to stop the country dividing, I think, is what we're doing. So, yes, it's a little bit more ambitious 
than we anticipated. We've now got over 75 partners in this and the first exhibition of the Gallery of Living History will be in April of next year in Coventry uh, to finish up Coventry being the year, as many of you Coventry Rotarians will know, Coventry is the, um, it has a year of culture this year. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. Thanks for sharing that, Jonathan, and, and hopefully we'll be letting Rotarians know a bit more about that as we go forward uh, in the peace building and conflict prevention area exactly. as well. That's right. That would be great. You know, Coventry, as we all know, is the city of peace and reconciliation. Um, the, the new cathedral there is an emblem of, you know, new Europe. So, yes, I hope very much you will you will help us all create this amazing initiative. New, newish cathedral, Jonathan, newish cathedral. I watched it being built when I was a child and I'm 73. <laughs> Actually, Molly, what? your hand has been up for ages. Would you like to ask something? Hi, Janine. Good evening, everyone. I think this evening we've heard some wonderful and inspiring stories, and it all goes back to all the work that Rotary and its partners have done regarding polio. But we are Rotarians talking to Rotarians, and there's a huge audience out there. We know that the great British public are generous to a fault, and we've seen evidence of this time and time again lately with Captain Sir Tom Moore and the huge amounts of money that have been raised. Why can't we jump on the bandwagon to get onto breakfast television, daytime television, and tell this story that we have been privileged to hear tonight and tell it to the great British public there's a huge fundraising opportunity out there. And if each country can do something like that to the wider public, not only does it publicise Rotary and all the good work that we do and have done, but it gives us a huge fundraising opportunity to get this job done. Here, here, Molly. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. How absolutely do you agree. do it? We've got contacts. Eve, you've got contacts okay. in the BBC. We've had Connie on, we've got a television producer, film producer here. How do we do it? Well, we, we need a campaign peg, really. So, you know, when we had the Purple for Polio campaign, we had over 900 uh, media reports because of that campaign. So it always helps to have some kind of peg in terms of news organisations. So, you know, looking at World Polio Day and other events, and we, we need to create the story, which we can do in a sense ourselves, and go out there and, you know, we are ridding the world of polio. There is a relevance to our fight against polio, to our fight against COVID. So yeah. we need to bring those things together to get that through on the media and we can do it. So I, I will be working with Janine as well on actually um, creating um, publicity opportunities for us, because I think that's really, really important. And I we need your we help as well. response from the public as a result of coronavirus, because there will be more understanding of what a virus can actually do. And I think now is the time to strike. Well, you're right, because I know a lot of our, our Rotarians have actually been uh, helping out at the COVID vaccination centres. And, and that's a, a, a place as well where we can tell our story about polio there. But yes, you know, we do, we do, we will work to raise the profile and we will do it. Jonathan, without putting you on the spot um, now, <clears throat> but is it something that you might be able to give us some pointers for at some point going forward as to how we might be able to do something? Yes, I mean, I think I think um, you're right. Totally, there's a, there's an opportunity. I think people are possibly more attuned to giving now. I think maybe I don't know. I mean, we're I'm involved in these two very big money raising. Um, initiatives for the CS Disabled Holidays and, and the Gallery of Living History. And, and we're finding, and the other thing is that people, a lot of people, particularly older people, have quite a lot of money at the moment because they've spent a year not really spending any money. Um, and, but it, you, you, know, you, it, you have a story, but it's about dramatizing that story um, to 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 your audience and the idea that you're so close to closing it off 
um, I think is the is the way of doing it to somehow dramatize the idea that it's so close to not being a thing anymore, but it's very close to coming back in a big way as well. Yeah. Um, so you, you, I think it's making it seem more dramatic because the statistics, if somebody tells me, oh, there's a disease out there and there are only four people in the world who've had it in the last six months, that's not a very good story. But if you're telling me we're three years away from shutting it down forever and as Ravi was saying, the amount of money that is to be saved, but the, more importantly, the numbers of lives to be saved, the fact that this is an emblem of positivity of civilization, there is a great story there. Well, perhaps we can talk offline to, to get your thoughts. We've got another five minutes, folks. Anybody else? I know Mukesh, I don't know if Mukesh is still here. He is, yeah. Um, can I ask that the silly well, question? Because you have had an opportunity, Mukesh, can we just see if anybody else wants to ask? Okay, I've got anything. my question in the chat box if, uh, if you do want to think about okay, it. Okay, thanks. Anybody else want to ask anything? You've got an opportunity now to ask all sorts of people from RI and TRF. <laughs> Stun silence. My brain's on strike. I mean, it's a holiday. Can I, can I, can, if, it's, if it's done silent, can I ask my silly question of Ravi then? Yes, please. Okay, Ravi, um, my name is Mukesh. Um, question I've got for you. There's lots of fake news running around about the um, what's happened with the 27 uh, polio programs, which have been possibly put on hold due to COVID. Um, is there... Is there any news about the, the, the so-called 27 programs, whether they are on hold or are they really happening? Because many Rotarians are confused and it would be nice to get a consistent message from uh, someone like yourself or even someone from within the UK because it, it's, um, it's not well, very uh, good news. Mukesh, first of all, I don't know what you're referring to as a 27 program polio. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether one of my colleagues, uh, either Barry or John, know about it. All I can tell you is there's nothing is on hold, as far as I know. John, can you comment on that, or Barry? Well, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know of anything that's on hold. I think that uh, we are going to take a two-week pause while we uh, change the computers at RI, but that's nothing to do with programs, so I'm not aware of anything, especially concerning polio or grants or anything. Yeah, more to do with the immunization because there was a, a thing that went round on Twitter uh, and it went viral that uh, Rotary had uh, put 27 of these um, end polio now programs, i.e. the immunization, on hold because of COVID. That's not true. The, they're doing NIDs right now. There's SNIDs going on. So uh, that's why I don't go to Twitter. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps Mukesh you can forward that to Eva myself and we can can look at that but I think what you might be referring to is what uh, Ravi mentioned early on in in the session and, and we are aware of is that back in the beginning of 2020 when Covid first hit uh, there was that pause in the mass immunization programs but they have resumed in many many countries but there are still children that need to to be reached as part of the catch-up process so that may be where the confusion is arising but if you send that to us we'll we'll get to the bottom of that david you wanted to say something well ha having all, all these knowledgeable people on the screen is it and following on from the previous discussion about fundraising is there a concept number of money that we need to raise in order to eradicate polio. We've got 50 million, which is the current ask, but how, what is that as a proportion of the, of the need? Are we looking for 500 million, uh, a billion, or 400 million? I mean, is, is, there, is there a sum uh, we could say, raise that money, solve the problem? The budget, the, well, the budget this year for GPEI was originally set at eight, between eight and nine, 900 million dollars but they needed because of covid they've actually gpi have asked for an extra 400 million dollars this year um and it's broken down into lots of areas i mean john germ will share with you how our the money that is the money raised by rotary and the matching 
from Bill and Melinda Gates has been spent, which is about 75 percent last year, I think, John, in relation to vaccine delivery, not just buying the vaccine, delivering it, but also a lot of the the sort of the campaign to it to tell people that vaccination is going to take place exactly as we're telling people about COVID now. But I mean, it's a lot of other things and, and, and in not quite about a third of the money is, is basically in areas you don't see, which is the surveillance, which is the one that tells us with confidence when the virus has disappeared. Yeah, I think John was going to say something there, weren't you, John? Well, our 50 million gets us 100 million from the Bill and Melinda Gates mm -hmm. Foundation. And one of the wonderful things about that is that they don't tell us how to spend their 100. It becomes our 100 match ours, so that's $150 uh, uh, million. The, uh, we have a meeting uh, next week with the uh, Finance uh, Committee for GPEI, and uh, we're probably going to be at $1.03 billion for this year. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then if you project out uh, right now through 2025, it looks like that we're going to be somewhere around $7 billion that it's going to take. Our part of that uh, depends on whether or not we renew our grant uh, with them. Our current obligation is through 2023. I suspect we will sign an agreement to extend that. So if you look at five years at $50 million a year, our role would be $250 million. Thank you. And that, that translates to $55 per Rotarian per year for Rotarians in Great Britain and Ireland. Yeah. Uh, and we fall short of that every year. And this year we are very short of that. So mm -hmm. every dollar really does count. And if we only raise 40 million in Rotary, we'll only get 80 million from the Gates yeah. Foundation. Right. If we raise 50, we'll get 100. So every pound we do not raise, we are losing another two pounds. So we're effectively losing three pounds. So it really is important. And literally, you know, 20 pence could save a life, three pounds would fully immunize, or three dollars would full, fully immunize a child. It's so easy to, to do, but so difficult as well. So everybody here, I, I'm really conscious of time, Eve. I don't know if you'd mm. want to wind it up. Yeah, I think we probably need to, because um, I know there were a few more, one or two more questions, but I think we probably do need to wind it up now, because, you know, obviously we're very grateful um, to everyone for being with us this evening. And I think that very important message about, you know, must continue to raise funds and awareness because it's our goal, it's Rotary's goal to rid the world of polio. We're just so close, you know, we, we have to do, we have to finish the job, you know, and, and polio now and forever. So- uh, let, me, let me interrupt you, it's not our goal, it's our promise. It, we I, promise it is our the promise. Children of the world we would do this. Exactly, exactly. And you know it's it's incredibly incredibly important that we do do fulfil that promise to the children and mothers of the world. It's you know it's incredibly important. And I think we've heard the reasons why tonight as well, haven't we? With some very powerful personal stories, um, you know, from 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 Ravi, Jonathan, Diana, and also John. So um, so thank you all for for being with us. Um, well, I interrupt you Eve and say thank you to you and to Janine for putting this together because it's it's been it's been a privilege. It's been a really enjoyable evening uh, and very interesting. And it's been a privilege to hear from from, from Jonathan and his mother and to have um, Ravi and uh, and John with us. So thank you, thanks to the two of you for having done that. Uh, and thanks to you, Tom, as well. So, you know, we're grateful that you're here as president of Rotary in Britain and Ireland. So thank you for that. So, um, Janine, have you, I don't know if anyone's got any other, other closing remarks, really, but uh, well, I just want to, Ravi wants to speak. Eva, I just want to thank uh, you and Janine. And I must tell you, it's such a privilege to be associated with uh, Robert Cavendish. Uh, it's been a great evening. Thank you so much for all the hard work that you put in. Uh, we will find this money somehow with your help and with the help of the others. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you, Ravi. Bye. There is one person also we should say thank you to who is completely behind the scenes. I don't know if he wants to open his camera up, but that's Phil, our technical wizard, <laughs> uh, Phil Dyer as well, who's made <laughs> all, all this possible. Without him, we couldn't have done it really. So, so uh, thank you as well. To, there he is, there he is. So thank you to Phil and uh, you know, 
it's a, it's been a wonderful evening so thank you for sharing it, it with us okay. and i think it's probably time to say goodbye to you all enjoy the rest of the evening um and uh, as i say you know here we we will do it we will end polio forever and we shall we we will we can and we definitely uh will fulfill our promise so thank you thank you to everybody for a very thank you and a diary day for you all right. Yeah, 27th right. of June is our next polio seminar focusing on how to tell our polio story and uh, use the power of that story with our media and in our advocacy efforts. So please, 22nd of June, 6 o'clock till 7, watch out for the details and register soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye, Darcy. Bye, Clive. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.